You see all of you with Bibles here. That is awesome. First, Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Verse 2, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful and shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things which we command you. Verse 5, and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Father, as we Look at your word this morning, be reminding us throughout the week to be picking up your word and reading it and enjoying it and abiding with you and fellowshipping with you. Thank you for the power of your word. This calls it to be something that, that stays in our mind and that helps to ground us and helps to firmly establish us in the ways in which you would have it do. Thank you for the very precious gift that it is. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week we looked at we looked a little bit more at Paul's prayers, how how he had given the opportunity, he had thanked God for the Thessalonians, he and Silas and Timothy in this letter. He thanked God for the Thessalonians, and then he prayed for the Thessalonians, and then after that he requested prayer from the Thessalonians, praying specifically in one way that, that he would be and Silas and Timothy would be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. We looked at this idea that there are troublemakers, these kind of troublemakers that Paul was talking about, that exist outside the church that try to impede the furtherance of the gospel, try to keep the gospel from getting out there and being heard. In this case, Paul may have been talking specifically about Jewish individuals who had not believed on Jesus Christ as the Messiah who came and sacrificed, was sacrificed on their behalf, on the whole world's behalf. He might have been talking specifically about Jewish leaders who are just kind of popping up wherever Paul would appear. It wouldn't make any sense for them to be there. But nonetheless, they would, they would pop up and have some kind of a focus on the law and try to get everybody distracted from the gospel of grace, the true gospel message that Paul was sharing with them. Could have been talking specifically about them or any other group of people who were coming and being unreasonable and trying to distract people from this gospel message. In any case, Paul was asking that the Thessalonians be praying for him so that wherever he would go and wherever he presently was, wherever that would be, that the troublemakers and the wicked people would not be able to distract people from hearing the gospel. We also saw that this is kind of a segue because Paul is going to be spending, beginning with verse 6 when we get there, from verse 6 to verse 15, nine verses talking to the Thessalonians about how they are to be dealing with troublemakers who are inside the church. Because we know even today that troublemakers exist outside the church who are trying to prevent the furtherance of the gospel, but even inside the church, those who have already believed on Jesus Christ as a Savior, there are still troublemakers within the church. <clears throat> troublemakers who in one way or another are, because of their behavior, their attitude, things that they're doing, things that they're saying, and we can all be troublemakers, depending on where our focus is at any given moment. If our focus is not on Jesus Christ, we know that our focus is on something else, and therefore, in a way, we too can be acting as troublemakers, kind of hindering an understanding of the gospel. Not for salvation, because we're already saved as believers in Jesus Christ, but hindering an understanding of how the gospel continues to be at work in our lives, conforming us more and more each day into the image of Jesus Christ. So Paul had, had asked the Thessalonians to be praying for him that wherever he and Silas and Timothy or whoever it was that was with him at any given moment, wherever they would go and wherever they would be, that there would be no troublemakers hindering a spreading of the gospel. And in a few verses, he's going to be exhorting the church, the Thessalonians, as he will with you and I, to ensure, to exhort them on how to deal with troublemakers that exist within the church. We also saw in, in verse 2 that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful. It's kind of play on words where Paul was using the same term, pistos, P-I-S-T-O-S, but he was using it in two different forms to talk about the lack of faith that these wicked and unreasonable men had in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the one who is entirely and completely faithful. The reality was that the, the faith that they lacked, P-I-S-T-I-S, -I -S, 
They were lacking in the one who was faithful, P-I-S-T-O-S, the only one who is entirely dependable all the time, whose character will never change, who will always <coughs> be faithful. So in essence, what Paul was doing, he was not only asking the Thessalonians to be praying that they would not, that the gospel message would not be hindered by these wicked and unreasonable people, but in addition, giving them a greater understanding that these people are lost. They're living in deception themselves. They're living in confusion because they have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've rejected the gospel message. And so there was another opportunity for the Thessalonians to be praying for the wicked and unreasonable, for those who are living in deception and confusion because they don't know the one who is truly faithful. They're placing their faith in something or someone, but they're not placing their faith in Jesus Christ, the only one who is faithful, the Lord. The Lord is faithful. We saw in verse 3, the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we identified some of the terms in, in this part of the verse. We looked at the phrase, from evil. And understood, came to understand that this phrase, it, it comes from, it, it's actually in the Greek what was called the genitive masculine singular. Not referring to evil acts that were happening around the Thessalonians or even evil acts that were happening to the Thessalonians. Paul wasn't suggesting that in the Lord's faithfulness that he would be keeping them from experiencing any kind of evil activity that was going on around them. We know that they were being persecuted just like Paul himself. So we know that wasn't true. But rather this term from evil in this singular masculine is talking about a single individual masculine identity referring not keeping them from evil acts but from the evil one. We shall establish you and keep you from the evil one. Establishing, we kind of likened that to the commercial polygrip from years ago, I think in 1989 by Claude Claude Akins was given, where they would take dentures, take a pair of dentures, and talk about the seed in the mouth and how that would be so painful. And take, a, take dentures and, and, and spread this fine line of polygrip around the dentures and then put the dentures in the mouth and how that would establish a very firm grip, set in place, immovable. And so the idea of establishing that Paul was talking about here was that the Thessalonians would be firmly established in their minds so that they would not be distracted or they would not be moved from that focus that Paul was consistently talking about, not distracted from that focus on Jesus Christ, that their minds would be firmly established, that the Lord in his faithfulness would be firmly establishing, firmly gripping or placing their minds on Jesus Christ. And as such, that would be one of the things that the Lord would be using to keep them from the evil one, to keep them from the snares and the traps and the deceptions and the lures of the evil one. If you recall, we, we likened, as, as Paul does, the devil, Satan, because he's talked about in Scripture as roaming about like a lion. And, and looking at the methods of the lion last week, we saw that typically... They will hunt at nighttime, sometimes during the morning hours, but they're opportunists. And they will hunt for their prey whenever they get the chance, whenever the chance arises. And so in this keeping, in the establishing of their minds, in this keeping the Thessalonians, in the Lord's faithfulness, keeping the Thessalonians from the wiles of the devil, who was trying to come at them whenever the chance arose, he was using a term in the establish and keep called the gnomic futures. Probably don't remember that. Who even hears of that, those, that kind of terminology today? But what, what Paul was saying was that the Lord is faithful and he shall establish you and he will keep you from this evil one who is going to try to come at you whenever the chance arises. The Lord is faithful and will establish you and keep you from the attacks from giving in to the attacks of the enemy now or any time the need arises. That's the tense that he used for establish and keep. We also talked about some of the primary ways that the Lord uses to establish our minds are to be, what? Reading his word. 
staying engrossed in the Word of God that He's given us as a tool. Remember, every time that we read about Jesus Christ even being tempted, and when He was in the desert, going without food, Satan being the opportunist that He is, looked at that whole time period and said, here's my chance. The chance has arisen. I'm going to take my chance now, but I'm going to be tempting Him. And each time, Jesus Christ came back at Him with the Word of God. If we have not been studying and reading and allowing the Holy Spirit to really cement into our lives the Word of God because of our involvement in it and the work that He's doing through it, then we will not have His Word readily available to us when temptations and trials come up in our lives. Firmly setting us in place, the reading of Scripture, through the conforming of our mind, the transforming of our minds into Christ's image, the work of the Holy Spirit, our abiding in Christ, Firmly setting our minds so that we are not easily distracted by the wiles and the deceptions and the darts that Satan wants to hurl our way. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and shall keep you from evil. We'll look at verse 4 this week. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you. That you both do and will do the things which we command you. We have confidence in the Lord touching you. That you both do and will do the things which we command you. Literally, Paul's talking here. He's saying... The, the, the idea of doing, he's talking about making, the idea that the Thessalonians, he is confident that the Thessalonians are going to act rightly according to what he has told them to do. They're going to act rightly, do the right things, and do them well. And that they're, that they're doing that, and they're going to continue to do it. He's using the term poeo, P-O-I-E-O. -E and he's using it in two tenses, in the present tense and the future tenses. You will do, you, you will act rightly, and you even are acting rightly. We have confidence that you are acting rightly, that you are doing the right things, and that you're doing them well, and we have confidence that you are going to do everything that we've commanded you, and that you're going to do them rightly, and you're going to do them well. In fact, this term that Paul uses for command, when he says that you both do and will do the things which we command you, this is far from any kind of a suggestion or any kind of a request. It's not as though Paul's referring to the commands that he's given them and saying, hey, if you remember back, there are some things that I kind of ask you to consider or to look at or, you know, kind of, kind of think about maybe putting into practice. And that's not what he was saying. This term for command, it's the same way, it's the same term for order. Paul and the command, you can look at the suggestions that Paul has given in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and consider them to be actual orders that he and Paul, and, I mean he and Silas and Timothy have been presenting to the church. These are things you need to be doing. Let's look at this. I wanted to see, I wanted to kind of get a, an understanding all together and kind of one lump sum of some of the commands, some of the orders that Paul had submitted to the church. Thessalonians. So I, I reviewed back through 1 Thessalonians and, and as far as we've gotten so far in 2 Thessalonians and I came up with kind of a, a list. I want to read it to you. Walk according to how we walk. Right there, my first thought. How in the world could anybody walk according to how Paul walked? We can't walk according to how Paul walked. We certainly can't walk according to how Jesus Christ walked. But he said, walk according to how we walk. Do what we say. Think what we think. Act how we act. Walk according to how we walk more and more. Abstain from fornication. Don't defraud your brother in any matter. Regarding brotherly love, you're all known for it everywhere. But increase more and more in your brotherly love. Study to be quiet. Do your own business. Work with your hands. Walk honestly toward them that are without the church, that are outside of the church. Watch for Jesus' return. Be sober. Put on the breastplate of faith and love for an helmet. Put on the hope of salvation. Esteem your elders very highly for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. 
those that are inside the fellowship, and everyone who is outside the fellowship. Be patient toward everybody. Don't render evil for evil unto anyone. Ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to everyone. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. There's more. Quench not the spirit. Don't despise prophesying. Prove everything that you hear. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Do not be soon shaken in mind. Do not be troubled. Let no man deceive you by any means. Stand fast. Hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether you have been taught them by word or by deed or by our epistle. And finally, pray for us. I wonder if any of the Thessalonians were making a list. We have an idea because Paul shares with us. We know of some of the key things, the key struggles, the key temptations and trials within the Thessalonian church because Paul addresses some of them, but it's certainly not a comprehensive list of everything that the Thessalonians were struggling with. And I wonder if any of them were making a list. If they were, they would have each, anyone who was doing that, would have ended up on one side or the other of the list. They would have either ended up on one on you'd have the good people and you'd have the bad people. You'd have the ones who are able to look at the list who may have been making the list and saying maybe even getting up in the morning and, and, and updating the list and putting little check boxes beside each thing and saying yep, I've done this, I can do this, I'm good at this, I'm doing this nice, as I'm doing well here, I'm doing well here, I'm following the list and furthermore What's wrong with you that you can't follow the list? There is a way in which we are called to be judging the actions of one another as fellowship, but not, not, not from some kind of a righteous, self-righteous, pious, judgmental position, fleshly position that lists intend to put us in. That's the position of the flesh that considers itself able to follow the list. And then you have the other side, the bad people. Those who say, yeah, I see the list. I see it very clearly. I see this and this, and you know what? Everything I see on here is failure, failure, fail, 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 the whole way down the list. Everything that I try to do, I fail at. I just wish that I could be as good as this person over here. You know? That's a place of the flesh, too. All I am is just shame, shame and, and disgrace, and all I do is a failure, and I'm just worth nothing because all I do is bad. Woe is me. You know, on the other side, <laughs> whether there was someone at the, the Thessalonian church, whether there's any of you here, making a list and saying, you know what? I'm good. I can follow this list pretty well. I don't know what's wrong with that. Or, whether you're on this side. You know what? I can't do any of this. I'm such a miserable person. I'm so shameful. All I can do is live in guilt and shame all the time. I just wish I could be like this person over here. Either way, either side, it's flesh. Focusing on the flesh. Focusing on the flesh because of a focus on the list. Anytime that we are moving into a focus on a list, we're focusing on our flesh and our ability either to do the list or our inability to do the list. Anytime we're focusing on those things more than we're focusing on Christ, we're falling into some of those schemes of the evil one that we are then easily susceptible to because we're not focusing on Jesus Christ. I want to read to you a poem that I came across it talks about a danger of these lists. This particular one is written from the perspective of somebody who is pretty good at following lists. It's called as position because the idea was that this individual felt as though, from the poem, they felt as though they were positioned to grow and to be a certain way. And they sure tried their hardest to live as it was that they were positioned. Listen to this. I feel like I shall never be able to identify me. 
One by one, I'm stripped away and find I fade with yesterday. Sometimes I feel as I was an infant, long ago. Clean, sweet, turned up, did not pout. I did what I was told to, and all they wanted in me came out as positioned. So I grew. When my brother came along and made my mother cry, I, and made my daddy angry, I kept busy being I. He would get in trouble and say things out of the way. I would just keep being there, the same as yesterday. They could always count on me to say and be real good, exactly what they wanted to, just the way I should. Please your mommy, don't make her cry. She can count on you. Please your daddy, don't make him mad. Be just right. Please do. Please do. Then one day, I heard in church a message on sins and hell. Up to the altar, my parents went and wished I had gone as well. I don't remember why I thought, except I had been good. And now my good, not good enough, required another, should? Over and over, each, each week, he pressured and pulled the soul he did seek. Fear raged within me and took its control and down to the altar went me with my soul. Everyone my parents knew looked at me through shaded eyes. And I increased the saccharine product of their pleased and wanting lies. Filled with good intentions, I grew as I was grown. My heart, in absent intervention, knew as I grew, I grew alone. Please your mommy, don't make her cry, she can count on you. Please your daddy, don't make him mad. Now add to this, the Lord, please do. Read your Bible, pray each day, live your life anew. If you don't, you will surely pay. He is watching you. Witness everywhere you go, down with movies and the dance. No more cards where money's flow. And don't give boys too much a chance. Do not fail, do not flirt. Be at every meeting. Think right thoughts or you'll be hurt. And never stoop to cheating. Do not smoke, do not drink. Use your head, stop and think. Don't be mean and don't be rude. And never, ever say things crude. The Lord is watching how you grow and then... This promise still, worse than you'll ever know, is living your life outside of his will. And so, as they close, in all my days of youth, I kept the rules required of me and gave to others half the truth and half the truth I'd yet to see. And dumb enough I was to think that the rules I had obeyed would provide me with the cup to drink of happiness today. Does this describe you? Can you relate in any way to the temptation or the tendency to follow a list, believing that if you just do the right things, even as a believer, which we are, and if we just do the right things, then if we just follow them well enough, then we will have joy and contentment in our lives. If we just, and, and, and boy, if I don't have joy and contentment, it must be because I'm not following the list wrong. Okay, let me go over here and try harder just so I can get, I, I see what I'm doing, but I'm not doing these things. If I just do better at following this list like I'm told to do, then maybe I'll have more joy and contentment in my life. There's a wonderful theme in Paul's letters. He says it in Philippians chapter 1, being confident of this very thing, that he, the Lord, who began a good work in you, that he will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul never suggested that our good works, that the Thessalonians' good works, he never suggested that the good works that we do or that he had even commanded the Thessalonians to do would come about as a result of their own strength. 
He never suggested that, that what they needed to do, and it's not suggested the way you and I do as part of the same church that the Thessalonians were part of. That the way to follow, the way to... He, he never suggested that what, what Christ desired for us to do would be for us to be focusing on these lists. Even though, if we wanted to, we could go and, as we did, make a list. There are certainly commands there. But the idea was never presented that these lists were something that we could achieve in our own strength or something that we were to try to achieve by focusing on them. Anytime that we place a focus on works or on a list, place a focus on that above Jesus Christ himself every single time, it will result in failure. The failure might be obvious or it might be subtle. The failure may even appear to be successful because it will appear to accomplish success in following the list. But it will always result in ongoing and continual turmoil, a lack of peace, because we can never achieve a perfect following of the list by focusing on the list itself. This gives us a cycle of inner turmoil. It's, it's kind of like, the, in some ways, it's similar to some 12-step programs or, or some other kind of methods that the world and, and even in, in some churches suggest that in order for you to gain control or, or have freedom from this or from that, you need to follow this step and this step and you need to do this and then you need to do this. Again, focusing on a list more than focusing on on Jesus Christ. Every time, in one way or another, it will end in failure. Something that's obvious or something that's more internal. A lack of joy. A lack of peace. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 4. We have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things that we command you. Literally, but we are confident in the Lord about you. He wasn't suggesting that his confidence, that Paul and Silas and Timothy's confidence was, was in the Thessalonians themselves and in their work and their ability to do, to follow through on these commands. What he was saying was that he had trust in the faithful Lord. Confidence in the Lord about the Thessalonians. Confidence in the Lord's ability to work out obedience in the lives of the Thessalonians because of their continued focus on Christ. The ground of confidence concerning the Thessalonians was not in the Thessalonians themselves. It was not, Paul was not placing confidence in their grace, in their strength, in their wisdom, he wasn't placing confidence in their good behavior. He was placing his confidence in the Lord and in the grace and the strength of the Lord and the power of the Lord. Without him, they could do nothing. But through him, strengthening them, they could do all things. Missionary team trusted that it was the faithful Lord who was and would be at work inside the Thessalonians to maintain them and to grow them. And to bring out of them lives that are more in line with Jesus Christ, focused on Jesus Christ, and thereby being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We have confidence in the Lord touching you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. This confidence, it was a persuasion, an assurance, a state, a condition, a state of trust. Paul had become persuaded in the Lord, and that persuasion was still with Paul. Again, the word confidence shows that Paul had complete trust, pistis, in the only faithful one, the Lord. The great confidence, the faith, the trust, the persuasion that the Thessalonians were doing and that they would continue to do 
the things that Paul had commanded them was not because of his great confidence in the Thessalonians themselves, but rather it was because of his great confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, the faithful one who was constantly at work in them through the sanctifying process of the Holy Spirit, despite the failures and despite the shortcomings of the Thessalonians themselves. When you identify with Christ, what is it that you're identifying with? You know, Jesus Christ is the one, we know, who came to earth as both God and man, took on flesh, and lived a perfectly sinless life. That means it was, there was nothing that he did, nothing that he said, there was even nothing that ever crossed his mind that was sinful. Are you, are, are, in, in, your own, in your own perception of yourself, are you suggesting that you need to live a life identifying with Christ in the sense of, I have to too, I too have to live some kind of a perfect and holy life. Because if I don't, I'll never have any kind of joy. We need to remember that Jesus Christ came to earth because he knew before we were even created, that we would never be able to live a righteous life. In fact, even the good that we do are filthy rags. There's nothing good that we can do on our own. Nothing. There's nothing that we can do, nothing that we can say, nothing that we can think in our own that is righteous. It is why Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law and die for us as a sacrifice to free us from the obligation of having to try to follow the law, having to try to focus on the law. Certainly, the law could never be something for any one of us that could bring us salvation. It can only condemn. Jesus Christ then followed the law and took on all of our condemnation on himself, on the cross, so that when he died, he died our death, he died the penalty that should have been ours, and when he rose again, he was proof that he had conquered death and hell. And instead of our having to, as a result, instead of our having to focus our lives on these lists and hoping that we're going to be good enough somehow, we can live lives of grace, understanding that Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit, is living inside of us and doing the work to conform us and transform us into His image. If you're a list follower, and I'd suggest that every single one of us is to one degree or another, we can either, <laughs> we can either look at ourselves on one side, some days we might do both. Say, I'm doing a really good job today of following this list. And other days, look at the same list and say, you know what, all I see is failure. And if that's you, then remember that as someone who has believed on Jesus Christ as their Savior, that these lists, they do anything but draw us closer to Him. That our daily focus, our being strengthened, our being set firm, involves not a focus on the lists, and whether or not we're strong enough in our flesh to do them or not do them, but to recognize and to focus on Jesus Christ, the one who died for us so that we would not be bound to lists, but bound to being able to focus on him. Let's pray. Father God, Without this work of Jesus Christ who came and died for us and sacrificed himself and, 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 and paid the payment for us, following the list would all be the only thing that we would have to be hopeful for. We can't, and there's no way in the world that we would ever be able to attain righteousness that way. We're born into sin ourselves. And 
Even if we were able to muster up some kind of good works that your word already tells us that there's nothing good that we can accomplish on our own. But even if we could, there would be nothing good enough that we could do to ever purchase forgiveness from you because our lives, we could never gain um, perfection. Father, be reminding us that's the very reason why your son Jesus Christ came to die for us. And cause us, Lord, to not merely understand this grace that was offered in light of salvation, in light of saving us, and, and, and uh, by which you were able to extend forgiveness to us. But, Father, help us to remember that even as believers, the tendency we have is to be distracted from Christ because of our flesh, because of the temptations of Satan, to be distracted from Christ and going back to these lists and falling on one side of the, of the line or the other. Father, remind to give us sensitivity to that. Give us wisdom and discernment so that when that is happening, we are drawn quickly back to you and quickly back to a focus on your son, Jesus Christ. And thank you, Father, that the continued work in our life is still not dependent on our following lists, but as Father, a result of the work that you are doing in us. And as such, help us to remain firmly focused on your Son, Jesus Christ, to be reading about your word, and to be abiding and fellowshipping with you. We thank you. In your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.